All right, um, to get started, uh, my name is John Priesner. Um, we'll go through some slides, but how this all started is Ryan Quinn um, and I. Hello. Um, Welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. This is yeah, it's a little. Turning it down a little bit. I have a loud voice. <laughs> so Ryan and I started. Uh, the whole thing started. We were trying to figure out where we could have a decent have a, a meeting about watches. Um, trying to get a group of people together who are enthusiasts and want to take a look at things. And, and um, my father-in-law, Dave Lohman, um, moved in about uh, two months ago, ish. Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> And so I, we were we were having my wife and I, Beth and I, were having lunch with today, and he was like, you know, it'd be a really good idea to see if you could do this at Oakdale. I said, that's a good demographic of people who would would really appreciate mechanical watches and history. So Ryan and I started kind of cooking cooking up idea. I worked with Dave Anson, and then uh, I think it was over a few texts uh, we came up with history and horology, because not only are we enthusiasts of the various watches and various timepieces of periods of time, but we're also interested in what's the historical background of why why this watch went this way, why the mechanics went this way. So we're going to call our little well, a little bit about you too. What are you doing? John? Well, that's that's another slide later. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, own, I own a shop here in town, uh, kind of an antique shop. But this is modern, and I buy and sell mainly furniture and lighting, but. A few vintage and antique watches, and that's how John and I met through a lot of watches. Yeah, so the, the fun backstory is I walked into Ulysses Modern. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's right, man. I walked, I walked into the well, Ulysses Modern, and I, I was interested, for whatever reason, I was, I was interested in collecting old Russian watches. Why Russian watches? Because they're kind of dime a dozen, and if you find them, they're very cheap, and there's, they're very interesting, very technologically advanced. So I left. A, I think I left my cell phone number with Ryan's wife Clara, and Ryan called me up, and so that's kind of how Ryan and I started. Is I started buying watches from Ryan, and it started with a little Raketa watch. Which when we get to that point in the history of things, I'll bring all my Russian watches in, and we'll talk about that. Um, but again, you know, Ryan and I were trying to figure out who would who would appreciate talking about mechanical watches in history, and that's the backstory, and then Dave suggested coming here, and then we were working with uh, David to get everything cooked, and tonight is the first history in Horology, so that's kind of how it goes. Um, let's see. So, I come from the university, um, I spent, you have to start with disclaimer, not experts. <laughs> we are just enthusiasts. Um, so we can, we can, if you're interested, we, we look at a lot of websites and a lot of online uh, references. We, uh, Ryan brought some books. I have a pile of watch books at home. Um, so that's where we get everything. We are not watch makers or repair persons, um, but we can point you in the right direction if you have any issues with your watches. And we're not appraisers. Uh, we can tell you that's a nice watch and it looks like it's a good watch, but if you, we, we are not professional appraisers. And then again, the, the last part of the disclaimer is that we're just doing this for fun. We just figured we'd, we'd bring some people along with, with the discussions that we tend to have every time we meet the last hours. So we figure, why don't we try to organize it and, and present it. So that's, those are the disclaimers. Um, and then we'll kind of start out. You know, probably everybody knows what this is. Either your grandparents had something Grandmother had something, and then it passed it down. Um, <clears throat> so basically, it's it's kind of what everybody knows as, as a pocket watch. But the, the really curious thing is, I was going to quote Julie Andrews <laughs> about where's the great place. Where's it? It's a where do you start? Did you start at the beginning? Because it's a very good place to start. <laughs> Somebody laughed. My wife laughed because she knew that was coming. So well, that's okay. Um, but yeah, we're going to start. As I was trying to figure out how to do. Try to start a lecture series or, or talk about watches. I, I, I threw around, should I start with my Russian collection? Should I start with the American collections? So we, what should we do? And you know, at the end of the, at the end of the day, I thought, why don't we just go ahead and start at the absolute very beginning? So that's where we're going to start. And if we don't like where that's going, we can 
pick and choose from a, a myriad of different places to jump from. But you don't have any examples of this early box. <laughs> no. Yeah. But we do have a lot of slides. So, <laughs> yes, it is suffered through my slide deck. There's, I think, 30 ish, but some of them are just quick looks and sees. So, this is the first wearable timepiece. It, it doesn't look like the slide previous at all, um, but this is the actual first um, watch. Uh, what it does look like is a pomander. So this is where the history and the watches kind of come together. So ironically, <coughs> the deodorant of the time is <laughs> basically what it, the gentleman who designed the watch decided to make it look like a, a deodorant pomander. pomander. Um, it's just French. It's basically deodorant of the time. Um, in the 1500s, one had a lot of clothes to put on <laughs> and, and to not smell rather Interesting. Um, people would wear a pomander. Oops, sorry. Would wear a pomander uh, filled with uh, ambergris or lavender, and they just that would be what they would wear all day long. So uh, this is what the first timepiece is, and the the maker was Peter Henwein um, from Nuremberg in 1505. So there was a lot going on. German Renaissance was happening, which is a, a, a huge topic. I didn't want to, I was looking at things I could bring in and discuss as far as what was happening in the German Renaissance, but that is a whole nother talk. Um, but he created this watch in 1505, so that made him giving his birth date of 1485 and his death at 1542. He was 30, 35 years old when he created this watch, and then he passed away um, in 1542 at the age of 57, if I did the math correct, um, which is a, a pretty solid age for 1500s. Um, and the watch back. So the crazy watch fact about this watch is this watch still works, which I, I think is pretty amazing. Um, he was paid 15 florins, which I always I like this in the quote where I was looking for it. The equivalent U.S. dollars was 140 to 1,000. <laughs> I don't know whose exchange rate they're looking at, but that, that's quite a range. Um, but the, the really cool backstory with this watch is that it actually appeared in an antique flea market in London in 1987. And a watchmaker's apprentice went into this flea market and bought a box of junk. And he bought a box of junk for 10 pounds, I think is what it was. Yeah, 10 pounds. And then they found this little ball of weirdness. And they started looking at it, and they took it to various places, and they found out, well, this is the 1505 Hamlin watch, the very first watch ever made. Um, it was appraised at between 50 and 80 million um, when they finally found somebody to actually appraise it. Um, and um, Peter Hamlin was actually a watchmaker. And so we're gonna go into some of the mechanisms and why that's significant, why he was a watchmaker. Um, but one of the things you'll notice with all of these really, really old watches is they're all key wind. So you'd have to have a separate key. You'd either wear it on the chain or wear it on, your, on yourself. Um, but, but it is a key wind mechanism. And so what I, I had to add this slide because I thought it was fantastic. So on the watch itself, on all these old watches sometimes there's they inscribe it with just some very poignant phrases. My Latin is terrible. Anybody have any Latin experience can talk it. I, had, I tried to put in a phonetic uh, uh, recording of it, and it didn't work out. I can't speak Latin, so I'm not going to try. But the translation I thought was ph phenomenal. Is the, time will, the time will escape me, but I will recognize the correct time. Or you can translate it also. My watches will flee on and recognize the correct time. So I thought that was pretty poignant to, for a clockmaker to make the first pocket watch, if you will, and, and have that and have the the insight to have that inscribed on it, um, and the fact that it's still running. <laughs> that is pretty phenomenal. So I wanted to show everybody what <clears throat> the inside of this first 1505 Palmander pocket watch. Um, what you can see, so I need my pointer, um, interestingly enough, is, is this mechanism actually 
So this would be the, the Fusée. Um, we'll get to, into the mechanics of that. I don't know if, the, the, if there's enough detail to notice, but this is actually a chain. It actually is links. It, it, I mean, it is an honest to goodness chain drive watch. But what you see here is, is the, the, the Fusée mechanism. Um, and what ends up happening is the chain winds around the chain. This is the, it has an internal spring and the chain is hooked to the outside. And as it winds around this barrel, it winds around the diameters of the fusée. And you can see, because the steel in the metal at the time was not great. <laughs> and so what they were trying to do with changing the diameter of the fusée as the watch wound down is to keep the constant pressure on the balance spring. And you know, there's a few pieces missing. I noticed this the other day while I was looking at the slide. There's a few pieces missing from the parts of the watch. Um, and so I'll show you the, those parts here in a second. But yeah, that's basically all the internal components that make up the first mechanical watch that still runs. So here's a kind of a, this is how the fusée basically works, is at the start where the spring is the tightest it, or the loosest, is you have uh, the diameter of the fusée is the smallest. So it, it changes, it. basically what it's trying to do is direct the, perp the same amount of pressure on the escapement and the balance wheel all the way through, which is a pretty phenomenal accomplishment in 1505. But that is what basically the Burge Fusée is. And here is the basic pictures of uh, the Burge. So <coughs> you can't see it <coughs> very well, but everybody knows that a mechanical watch is you have this, the balance wheel that spins and the spring that, that causes it to come back. And this is the crown escapement. Um, in a modern watch, it's, it's, it's set horizontally. And with the verge escapement, it's actually set in a vertical position. And they call it a crown escapement because you can see that it basically looks like a crown. Um, let's see, this is a little bit more helpful. What I, I honestly didn't realize until I, I looked at some of these early diagrams is that on the actual balance wheel is you have two paddles. You have a paddle at the top that catches the pressure, and then the paddle at the bottom that pushes it along. So it's, it has to be perfectly balanced and juxtaposed it perfectly in degrees to, to, I always looked at it, I came up with this while I was thinking about it, is the escapement. And basically the idea is the power that's put into the spring escapes through the spring through the escapement. And so basically the idea is to let the power out of that spring very gently and very properly at the right time. And it's basically just adjusting these paddles to catch the, the top of the tooth and the bottom paddle to push it along. So that is what the Burge crown wheel and skin take a look, look at. And then I wanted to show <laughs> some of the slides and some of the information is really fun. Um, but <laughs> what I loved about this was the fabulous early Bruges for safety. Well, I don't know, I'll take issue with fabulous. Uh, but it is an interesting, I mean, those early springs were pretty tough. And so basically it's like a clock key. So <clears throat> early, early <clears throat> fusées, to wind the watch, you'd, you'd have to take out a key like this and basically wind it up like a, uh, probably more like a, Music box is, was the way I would start to think about it at the time. But yep, the fabulous early version of key. Um, more commonly, um, the keys would look something like this. Um, just a, basically a piece of metal where you have a key at the top to wind. I'm not really sure what this pokey bit's used for, honestly. I, was, <laughs> I haven't really found the reason why that was there. Um, yeah. So those are the various keys you would use to wind. Um, so really the next step. So, is to come back from these early pomander type of hanging around your neck types of pocket watches, which probably weighed a little bit because they're all created out of brass and they're fairly large. Um, and so the term pocket watch was coined by King Charles II um, of England because he started wearing his pocket, his watch where he wanted a watch to wear in his pocket. Um, and so, that's where this all came from. Um, 
the really interesting thing is he introduced um, wearing the pocket watch. He was the first person to start wearing um, a waistcoat. And why that was important, as, as I'll show you in the next little slide, but basically it was important because he, he was basically sticking his thumb out <laughs> at the French. So he didn't want he didn't want to look like the French. He didn't want to wear anything like the French, and so um, he started wearing a waistcoat, and therefore he wanted a pocket watch. To, he wanted to create a, a, a smaller verge, we say, pocket watch that wasn't a round ball, so that he could wear it in his waistcoat. Um, so basically, that's that's what changed watches. Is King Charles II. Um, so to not say that I'm I'm biased in looking for my data. I just wanted to point out that, I, and I wanted to point out the year, pretty important. So Vogue magazine ran this article about three-piece suits in 2020, which I thought was fantastic. Um, so it goes into great, great detail about King Charles II um, being very monarch, um, making sure that, that he was the first person to start wearing vests and um, continue it, of course, it says that he wanted to increase the wool trade and force Nolan to abandon <coughs> French fashion, of course. Um, and then uh, I think it was uh, Sam Pepys, a politician. The king hath yesterday in council declared his resolution of settling a fashion for clothes in which he will never alter. It will be a vest, and I know not well how, but it is to teach the nobility thrift, and I will do, and will do good. And apparently it did. So uh, he, Pepin's remarks days later that everybody in the court was wearing the vest and had uh, skipped over wearing the silk and the fashion and the lace as everybody had a vest on. So, but again, just to, you know, I'm not biased in my knowledge. We, we went to Vogue magazine for this one. Um, and again, kind of the historical facts of the time. So King Charles lasted, he, he lived for 55 years. And why that's significant in my mind is that he survived the first plague. <laughs> that's impressive. And then the other, the really interesting thing that I didn't know is that there was a great plague of London that came in 1665, where there were 7,000 people a day that passed away from the plague in London itself and in, in the city. Um, he survived the great fire of London and then he died, ironically and oddly, of a stroke in, in 1685. Um, historically, he had no legitimate children. However, he had 14 illegitimate children. Um, uh, let's see what else. Um, it was interesting. He was succeeded by his brother. Obviously, he had no heirs, so, and the illegitimate children couldn't take it. So um, he was succeeded by his brother. And I think I read on his deathbed he was talking to his brother James and said, take care of my mistresses. I think that's, that was his last words. So this is a, I, I think the word is opulent, I think is, is what comes to mind when I see a watch like this. And I think Ryan can speak, as we've seen a few of these. I mean, not personally, probably in a museum, but the um, you know, 1665, folks who could afford something as fancy as this, it, it was opulent to the end. Um, but yeah, this is an actual pocket watch uh, from 1665 or 1645. So it's all gold and gilt. Um, interestingly enough, these old watches with the Birch Fusées do not have seconds hands. Uh, they were lucky to have hours and minutes that worked pretty well. These, these are pretty rudimentary things. They did keep decent time for, for what would be considered uh, mechanical timekeeping at the time. But you can also see the, the mechanism here is that you have a a top plate, and they, they decrease the size of the verge escapement a little bit, uh, but it's still thick, <laughs> if you will, for a pocket watch. I mean, this is probably a solid, I would say it's probably about a solid inch, and then when you close the lid, it's probably pushing probably a two inch, two inch type of pocket watch, and it's going to be pretty heavy. Um, I'd probably guess it's three and a half inches of rough cross. So that's uh, just an example of the 1650-45 pocket watch. <clears throat> so curiously, 
the next innovation in, in pocket watches, now that we, we can coin the pocket watch since King Charles, didn't happen until 1760. So that's 255 years of basically the same mechanism in a timepiece, a pocket watch or a palm ender or, so 255 years of the same technology being used and being improved and, and continuing to work. And then uh, Jean-Antoine Lapine, um, now this is something, that I, I did the quick math again, but this gentleman lived to be 93 years old in 1814. That's, that's, that's spectacular. Um, but he dispensed with the, the whole Fusée movement, movement. And you can see with the Fusées, you have to have, it has to be a large mechanism because it has to have the certain diameter that starts at the top and the certain diameter that stops at the bottom and it has to have a spring diameter barrel that can wrap this big old chain around it. Um, he basically said, I'm, I'm not really, I don't, let's not do that. And he basically created, bit, honestly, what almost every watch from then on has ever run on. It's just called a going barrel. And basically what that does is it powers a watch with a, a gear inside it and the spring wound inside of it with an arbor that comes out and the power is transferred by the gear on the outside. I'll show you a picture here in a second, but um, oh, let's see where's, oh, uh, the other really important thing is that the French watchmakers, so Lapine uh, created this going barrel and he also started um, working with a different escapement other than the Burge escapement and he called it, he called it a cylinder escapement and it'll, it'll make perfect sense here in another slide or two. The cool kind of fun fact about Lapine is that he was a good friend of Voltaire. So I thought that was really interesting. We could, we could dive into that history too. Um, but yes, I mean, almost every modern pocket watch has this, this, it's a little different from Lapine's. Um, he has the gears on top, which is just a, a different way to do it. Most of the time on a modern watch, the gears would be on the outside and run the, the fourth gear would be out here. But um, yeah, this is basically the progenitor of all mainspring winding arbors. And this is, a, this is a nice couple of diagrams about a cylinder escapement. So as you look at the verge escapement, it had paddles on the balance wheel that would go back and forth and touch the, the crown wheel. And so to, to decrease the size, they created this cylinder escapement. And then this is, the cylinder is attached to the uh, balance wheel and then the escapement controls the power. And this is a kind of a slow schematic of how the uh, cylinder escapement actually functions to control the power coming from the mainspring. And this is actually a 1736 Lapine caliber, the actual watch. And you can see the, the going barrel here. So this is where the spring arbor, the spring is inside this piece. And then you would take a tiny key out and wind the watch. And then this actual other key, the square key here, is actually another key that will actually set the time, which is attached to the first wheel, second wheel, third wheel, escapement stint right there. You can see that. And then there's the balance wheel and then the a regulator. But yeah, this is an actual 1763 Lapine caliber. And to kind of show you what the watch started to look like from a two inch moon pie <laughs> kind of a watch. Um, this is what was offered at Christie's auction house, I think two years ago. But this is an actual Lapine caliber watch. It doesn't have a very good side view, but you can tell, you know, now we have hour, minute, ooh, what's that? Seconds hand? So we went from, from just having hours and minutes for 255 years, and then we came, we started having minute hands once things started to get a little bit smaller and you could put more gears in with the whole mechanism. So now you have, in 1750, you have, you have a watch that tells seconds. And Mr. Lapine was fairly active in the, the watch making and uh, he worked a lot on things. The really interesting thing that I found is he was the first horologist. And so we're gonna, we'll, we'll take a look at this. He, looked, he was continuously trying to work on aesthetic design. So this kind of 
prettiness and perfectness kind of perfectly describes a pen's work. I thought this was really interesting. He used Arabic numerals. So and, until now, everybody was using Roman numerals. And Ryan, Ryan can attest is I only buy watches with Arabic numerals on. <laughs> That's like Roman numerals. I don't do Roman numerals very often. Um, see, what else? I think that's pretty much Lapine's. Oh, the, another um, contribution to watchmaking. In fact, I just bought a pair of these hands for a 1929 uh, Burlington North or Burlington one. Is the Burgett hands? Is it's a uh, open moon hands, which uh, that was that was fascinating. That he was the first person to create watch hands that looked like that. So now we're taking a look at another big jump, um, 87 years. So again, Le Pen's, all of Le Pen's watches, all would have to be key wound. And so you'd always have to have a key that always, you had to have a key with you if your watch stopped, you'd have, or if you didn't have a key with you. So um, like, I'm going to butcher his poor name. I was trying to have Beth tell me how to pronounce his name. I say Lego Jaeger Le Couture. But somebody who's French or has more French than me can, can jump in. But it was 87 years after the pain. Um, so the really interesting thing that I thought about these two different watchmakers is Le Pen wanted to have a, a pretty watch. He wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, and so 87 years later, Jaeger comes on and says, I don't really care about how it looks, but it has to be accurate. And so he jumped into this incredible chunk of um, making sure the watch is actually telling time. So he was obsessed with accuracy. I mean, we could do a whole uh, half hour lecture on this gentleman, because uh, all, all he wanted to do is make sure that it was to say the time, go to the time. And he was not a physicist, and he was not an engineer. But he conceived of the micron as a measurement. No tool of the day could detect the exact degree and precision of an inaccuracy of a watch. So to raise the bar, he developed the millimeter the world's most accurate measuring movement. And that's the benchmark for more than 50 years. Um, and so what's really cool is so he created the watch in 1855 for his wife on her 45th birthday. And believe it or not, I have found slides of that watch. So you can see, now we're starting to get into what looks like what we would know as a normal pocket watch. It just looks like a normal pocket watch. It's from 1855. Um, but yeah, it's, it's exactly what we would consider our, our normal pocket watch. And so you can kind of see now, oh, actually what I, I wanted to mention is what you don't see inside is he also created, the, the next big step was actually what was called the keyless works. So up until Jaeger started working on watches, everybody had to have a key. He was the first person that would be, you would use the pendant to wind the key and set it. And so, I don't have a picture of his first keyless works, we can get into that some other time, but um, they didn't offer, the keyless works on most watches are under the dial face, and most people for an 1855 watch aren't gonna take the watch apart to show you the, the keyless works. <laughs> They're just gonna leave it alone. But um, nonetheless, uh, this is this is a, a pendant set and wind, and so that was what I wanted to show with these two slides. Um, and it has a going barrel, and I'm assuming this has probably got a cylinder statement in it as well. Yep. We're still making these. Yeah, he's he's still in business. Yep. And that's a little more close up of the the mechanism. Let's see. And honestly, that's where we're at. I'm spot on a half an hour, so I didn't keep you long. So I figured what, what we wanted to do is, is Ryan and I will be trying to put some lecture series together or talks for a half an hour, and then we can just hang out and talk. And if you guys have questions, we can answer questions or, or point you in the right direction for questions for a half hour. Some talks may go longer than a half hour, but I figured I'd keep this. I didn't want to bore you too much. And keep it. Yes? Did you bring any watches? I didn't this time, because I wasn't sure if I, sh I should, could, or 
or what, but but if that's an interest, I, I have a collection of watches and Ryan has a collection of watches. Get further into watches that we own, we were going to bring examples to show everyone and pass around. But, uh, do I have quite any watches that early. Yeah. I yeah. have had them before, but I don't yeah. buy them more. Yeah. Versions are, like Ryan said, you can buy versions fairly cheap, but you can buy them fairly cheap because they're around, because nobody, they're really, if they break, if the chain breaks, you're in big trouble. And watch collectors tend to not like the, the PC watches, the chain driven watches, they don't, they're not really a beautiful watch where like the, the movements and. Yeah, unless, unless you're historically interested, they're not as, yeah. fan, not as, I think they're been out fantastic. And also one of the things is they're hard to work on because they don't have, some of the early ones don't have screws. They only use tapered pins to like, to hold things together. So you really, really, really have to know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and basically tapered brass pins that are tapped in. And it, it, they're very finicky little mechanisms. So I've, I've seen a few people, usually they're in the UK, um, like a lot of the folks who work on Fouse watches are, are UK because that's that's where most of them are. Um, but um, yes, there was another question. Now, once you wind the watch, how long would that last? And when the original watch, did you have to wind every day or more? Oh, I would probably guess, given the materials that they had in the old Fouse watches, it was probably about I would say every six hours or so. Yeah, a couple yeah. times. Yeah, a yeah, because yeah, there's just not enough power in that old. We can go into a whole bunch of really interesting uh, metallurgy things, but back in the day, they basically, oh, this is springy, we'll throw it in, we'll make it work. And there were a lot of metal, a lot of really interesting chemistry and metallurgical ideas that came out about okay, that was more springy than just tempered. And, and what happens with a tempered metal is you tighten it too tight too many times and, and, and you're snapping. We can go down that rabbit hole because that, that is a phenomenal chunk of science. Yes? stories from some of the guys uh, who collect the older watches and you can imagine the, the mechanisms aren't as refined and so if, if you're looking for something to put you to sleep and you like a tick tock is these old old Elgin pocket watches you can hear them across the room going and so one of the gentlemen actually he his his I think it was his granddaughter his granddaughter was having trouble sleeping I think she was four and so he had an old 1880 Elgin and he wound it up and set it on the stand because he would snuggle her at night and he would always have the pocket watch issue. So he basically gave that to her, put her on her nightstand and would wind it up and she'd fall asleep with the pocket watch ticket. So, <laughs> just saying. I tend to be that way, Beth hates it, but I, I like hearing my pocket watches tick on my night table. Any other questions? Yes? That's a, that's a fantastic question. So early early watchmakers early watchmakers probably did it all of their own, um, but there was a, a movement in Austria and France. They're called Ibouche. So what they would do is that there were people who were really really good. So early watchmaking before it came to the United States, it was more industrialized. They had a lot of people who specialized in special parts, right? And so in in Europe, you had an Ibouche who who would make going barrels. So, and then, then there'd be a company that would buy all those parts and put them together and call it their watch. So that's, that's kind of how it started in Europe. And then when it came to the United States, the United States being in the 1800s was, let's do it all, and they did. And so then you would have actual movements that were all created by a single company, um, Nashua, um, Hamden, early Hamden stuff, um, Elgin, you know, they were they were making all their own stuff with all their own equipment. So yeah. And a lot of Illinois too in our neighborhood, yep. a lot of handmade watches came from right here in the Midwest. Yep. yep. Yes, sir. I think watches. Uh, this is quite fascinating. And I'm thinking of other things. For instance, as a kid, I 
signs of it collecting stamps, except that it got kind of expensive. And, <laughs> and then when my son was about the age I was when I was interested in stamps, he said, Dad, you shouldn't have done stamps. You should have done coins. I said, well, <laughs> I can't go back and redo it. Uh, here's Jay Leno collecting cars. Uh, I assume you could collect uh, belt buckles in my own case. Uh, many years ago, I was on a dig, a dig in Israel, and I collected some pottery, some potsherds, but some whole pots. And I've been, I've been back twice since 1968, and, and prices have gone up. But, but I have collected a few more specimens of pottery. So what I'm wondering is, is the kind of thing you're doing with watches, which I find quite fascinating, applicable to some other type of thing that a person could collect? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and so, you know, when I started with Russian watches is what I could afford. Um, but the, the, the technology in Russian watches, Russian watches got a really bad name because it was Russian watches, Soviet watches. Um, and now they're just mass producing their junk. And I, I won't tell you the story uh, because it's another lecture and, and it'll ruin the outcome. But <laughs> suffice it to say, um, I started with Russian watches because you could buy them for $40 and $50. And, and, but you can collect. I have a lot of guys who collect <clears throat> war stuff, and so they like watches from World War One, World War II, Vietnam era, Korea. I mean, they want one example at least from all the wars that they can. Or um, I get people who collect a lot of crossover is what I guess I'm trying to say. Like they might not necessarily collect watches, but they'll buy a watch or they'll want a watch to put into another kind. Yep. Comic book guys, or Mickey Mouse guys, yep. or like, yep. and there's a lot of watches that did all kinds of pop culture stuff too. So there's a lot, of, a little bit of that. Um, I have a watch that was like a special edition by a, a modern artist from the '80s. So that would maybe kind of cross over into modern art and stuff like that with a watch. Yeah. So that, I think there's a little, there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, Kevin Ryan kind of gives me a bad time because what I'm, how my watch collection is going right now is like collecting the the technological steps. You know, I, what was the next thing? So that's kind of why I tailored this lecture that way. Oh, there's another question. Yes, sir. Would you like to comment on the evolution from watches into chronometers? That that is a that is another whole lecture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the chronometers. Um, Ryan might be uh, somebody. Ryan might actually know more about chronometers than me. More uh, exact timepieces is how I take it. And later on, watches were more certified to be a, a, a like a chronometer to keep specific times. Like railroads, I would imagine, and stuff like that. Or pilots. A lot of times, knew that a watch that was exact. Um, I bought a watch today that was. Certified chronometer. Nice. Uh, I have a hard time doing that. I was trying to get the technical differences, if any. Oh, I think so. The way, the way I look at chronometers, like a, a three button chronometer, so you have a start and stop, is that what you're referring to? No, I meant the ones that were used in order to determine longitude, for example. Gotcha. Um, I think. Likely, it had to do with the amount of engineering involved in the in the materials. For instance, a, a chronometer of the age probably didn't use Bill's steel yard for the spring or Tom's brass works. Well, well, you know, they probably that. had some very very intricate, very expensive um, engineering involved and machining involved, rather than a watch for the masses. I would assume. Dana Sobel's book on longitude really is what has sort of a history of, of changing into what we call chronometers. Awesome. And uh, it's an incredible story. So. Fantastic. So what would your definition of it be? I, I think I only started getting called that when, when uh, what, I, I blocked on the guy's name who did this, who worked on it for 60 years. Uh, so you can measure longitude. And I always took it as an exact, like it was 
it's not more or less than like a second off a day so that you could do that and you needed to set your longitude off of it. So well, I was how I took a watch that was certified like that, which is a fancier and more expensive watch. So I can, I can speak a little bit just on the, the only thing I know and I got like a little bit are railroad chronometers. Um, so a railroad grade pocket watch. Um, I think it was in 1891, it could be plus or minus a few years there, but the American Railroad Association came out with a strict rules about what you could call a railroad grade pocket watch. And I'll, I'll bring you a couple examples because they are fascinating. Um, and I don't know all the, te all the, the technical specs on them, but the watch had to have 21 joules. So 21 joules, what that means is these old, early watches that would have maybe different, uh, the shafts were one metal, and what they rode in and what they spun in was a different metal. And what they found out early on is that that metal, on metal, wears out. And so if somebody came up with this idea of, hey, how about I find in, in a ruby, is what they call them. And so basically a jewel in any watch is basically a synthetic ruby that has a hole drilled into it. And so metal in a, a, a you know in a you know Rockwell 100 ruby doesn't wear out and it's smooth and it runs better and it runs faster it runs longer um, and so I have at least two examples at home of railroad grade um, Burlington watches ironically um, but yeah they're 21 jewel watches they are to be certified they have to be adjusted to time and temperature and they can only be off one minute and 24 hours. Um, so I can tell you that last night, I, Ryan and I did a watch, I did a watch swap yesterday with uh, Todd at Artifacts. I swapped a, a Swiss, a fancy Swiss watch that I don't collect and I picked up two American watches. One was a 1907 Elgin and I wound it up and let it go. And then the other one was my gold Burlington Railroad. Wound them up and set them there. Uh, this morning at noon, the railroad watch was still ticking and the 1907 regular watch had stopped. Seven jewels versus 21. Um, and you, it's just, um, so yeah, that's, that's the chronometer for railroads. Um, that's, that's what I know. But um, I can bring the list. That's a whole other talk about a pocket watches in the United States. So what was the book again that you mentioned, sir? Logically, the author was Dana Sobel, S-O-B-E-L. And it actually has all this sort of history. This guy worked. So that, that's interesting in the American pocket watches if it's an 1800s. So I have a couple of 18s. My um, 1907 that I picked up yesterday is an 18s. So it's a monster. Um, I have an 1881 at home, Elgin 1881, and it's even more of a monster. I mean, they're just big and heavy. And you could, you know, as, as materials moved along, they got, the watches got smaller. So you may have, if it's really big, it's likely like an 18S. And this book I have up here could tell, if you bring it the next time we do one of these, we could tell you everything about it from the book. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Could you say a little bit about the transition of measuring time away from time pieces? Uh, what I'm thinking about here and athletics where you may have a person who runs a mile in, et cetera. Yep, yep. But he's being measured. 
measured not with a watch, but with Yeah, it would be a, a stopwatch. And you know that that's a whole nother uh, yeah. yeah, I mean it's a whole nother Oh, that the electronics though, 1960s maybe when they started electronic electronics. Watches called chronograph watches, yep. which have a stopwatch and a, a clock or a watch on it too. Yeah, they're they're that is that is a whole other amazing. I think I have I have one or two chronographs, but they're all actually quartz or uh, solar. Yeah. Uh, but the old the mechanicals. Electric. Basically. Yep. They're, yep. They're keeping time by electric. Yep. Electricity. <laughs> yep, but yeah, there's old, there's a whole, man, stopwatches and chronometers go, go back a long ways, and they were all mechanical for a very long time. Um, I've seen old Tag Power stopwatches from the 30s. So yeah, and of course, that's where it kind of established, you know, these, these higher standards, right? If I have a stopwatch, it better be a higher standard. And so then you can jump into the Swiss manufacturer and the Swiss standard for, yeah, it is a, it is a it is another awesome rabbit hole that we could dive down. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have some watches that are old, maybe maybe a hundred years uh, that were gifts. What do you do with these old watches? And you think I thought they were good. Yep. They got gold, very gold. Yep. And I took it to Murphy and Sucker and said they weren't worth anything. <laughs> I don't know if that's well, the gold's definitely worth something. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, for, for Ron, both Ryan and I, I mean, was it, what is it worth, right? I mean, I would, I would bet if I, I showed oh, my, yeah. if, I, if I showed my, my pocket watches to, to an appraiser, they'd be like, yeah. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't have, I don't want to spend the amount of money that would be needed to buy high-end things that in 10 years will be worth the $30,000. But for me, I just... Well, that, that's a really good question. So Bulaba was made in the U.S. for a certain amount of time, but then they were also switched to Swiss. Uh, <laughs> so watches, though, uh, typically in the like, collecting world, have a lot harder time finding a buyer than a men's watch. So a woman's pocket watch, even from the same era as uh, a men's pocket watch, will be far less in value than a men's just because men are typically the ones collecting them. And even the women that, that collect them these days, they want a man's, wa a man's watch, yeah. a bigger watch, mainly because they're easier to read more than anything because the women's watches were always a lot smaller than yeah. men's watches. So even in the gold content of a woman's watch, it's far less yeah. than a man's watch too. Like a men's watch might have $500 in gold and a woman's might have 75 or 100. So to a big deal place like Stalker, uh, they might be like, yeah, it's not worth our time. Yeah. So that might be why you're getting that from them. Now, if you took it to a, a guy who specializes <coughs> in watches, they're definitely valuable to him because any of the parts or anything that's old and ha it has value to a, uh, a watchmaker or someone yeah. who just deals in watches. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. My wife inherited a pocket watch where the stem that you used to wind it looked like the stem that you showed us on several of them. Mm -hmm. But to set it, you had to pull out a little thing yep. on the side. Yes. Yep. yep, those are called lever set. And so that's part of the, uh, it might be a railroad type of watch. So even my 1907, which is not technically a railroad standard because, um, but it has a lever set. And what they, why they did that, Technically, is if you have to unscrew the case to pull the lever, is that you're not going to change the time accidentally by bumping the pendant or twisting the pendant when you're trying to wind it and you miss set the time. And so when the railroads did, that was, that was kind of a railroad thing, is that they wanted to not have accidental changes in <laughs> your perfect timepiece. And so they made you actually unscrew the top of the watch, pull out the lever to change the time, and then put it back on. You could wind it all you want to make it run longer, but if you needed to reset the time, you had to unscrew the top, pull out the lever, adjust your time, push the lever back in, put the cap back on the time. It's just, uh, if you will, like a safety measure. Yep. And a lot of times it's a, uh, an indicator of a nicer watch. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep, because it's an extra mechanism in the watch. Yep. I just have a couple more slides because I need to say, say thanks to a couple other people real quick. Um, one is Dave, I don't know if Dave's here, David Anson. I don't, I don't think he's here, but he really helped me to get everything dialed in. Um, you know, we started this process a couple months ago and we got a date within a couple weeks and, and here we are. And then Ryan looked at the presentation and gave me some cues in and then I had another good friend of mine, uh, JC Cortez, who actually came and looked. And then thanks for all of you for coming. Um, here's reference page one. <laughs> These are all the all the links to everything. I can provide those if you want to chase anything. Um, here's references number two. Because <laughs> there's a lot of, it, you know, it's a, like I say, it's a rabbit hole. You get started and you can just go forever. And then I wanted to show this. This is my watch bench of, as of this morning. I actually had the day off. So this is my watch bench with... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine. Probably. Well, as a disclaimer, John has a lot more guts with that. I don't <laughs> get into this with watches. I'm more of a fan and uh, he takes them apart. I used to wear, I was an old farm kid, so I used to have to do all the mechanical stuff on the farm, and then I did cars in high school, and then I got to college, and I didn't have anything I could work on, didn't have a shop place to work, and so now I work on small things. Very small thing. In fact, I was using a drill this morning uh, with my, my drill. I think it was a point one drill bit. I can't think of where. I think that watch is in here. But uh, the, there was a rusted screw that I had to drill out and had to. It was a point one millimeter drill. Got it. <laughs> what? I think one more question. Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> I know from Ryan, where is your shop? <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming.